I present the um, Royal Museum for Central Africa and specifically for the collection of aerial photographs that we have there. But first of all, a few words about the institution. Um, the Royal Museum for Central Africa is a, um, it's a research institution uh, with three departments, biology, earth science, uh, human science, with uh, 200 um, staff members, including 80, uh, 80 researchers. And we used to host um, um, 150 uh, internships or PhD every year. So we have quite uh, important collections. Um, besides of the ethnographic uh, objects and uh, zoological specimens, etc., the Earth Science Department is in charge of um, uh, managing collection of maps, uh, aerial photographs, and minerals and rock samples. The mission statement of, the, of that institution is, first of all, research. Uh, of course, the management of uh, collection, public-oriented service, uh, sharing knowledge, uh, organizing ex exhibition, uh, for instance, and uh, not but not least, last but not least, um, institutional collaboration with African uh, scientific uh, institution. So the uh, aerial photograph collection from the African Museum has been inherited um, after the independence of, uh, of the Congo, and it also includes a sub collection from coming from the National Geographic Institute. Um, on consignment at, uh, at the African Museum. We have a problem that Benoit already uh, raised um, earlier this morning. Uh, the history and the origin of this collection are not very clear. We do not know exactly when and how it arrived at, uh, at the museum, and this, this represents a lack of information that could be use, uh, useful today. Um, the collection is essentially uh, focused on uh, former uh, Congo, uh, Rwanda, and Rundi. Um, it has been acquired during uh, the, the period of the 1940s and 1960s. It has continued over Kinshasa after the 60s, but this is quite marginal. In total, we have something like 370,000 documents, including prints, films, and, uh, and glass, glass plates. But there are many duplicates, and this is one of the problems that we are facing. We don't know how these collections were put together, and there are some overlaps between the collection that we need to uh, investigate. Uh, after, in the 70s, 80s, there has been um, new uh, coverage um, performed by, um, for, for the, the Rwanda and Burundi uh, after the independence. So, um, <coughs> During the colonial time, um, the Congo was administered by different um, authorities. There, there was, of course, the, the, the main colonial uh, authorities, but there, has, there, there were some um, uh, sub-administration, uh, including the, the Comité Special du Katanga, du Katanga. It's a special committee for Katanga um, administrating that region. There was another one in, uh, in the Kivu and other regions. And in Katanga, for instance, uh, they had their own uh, geographic institute and geological institute, and they uh, performed flight uh, over these uh, specific areas in southeastern of the, of the country. So there were various operators. Um, essentially, the military geographic institute uh, in Belgium, but through the, the geographic institution of, uh, of the Congo, um, and also there has been some uh, other um, operators later. We are facing uh, quite many uh, challenges. The first one is, of course, um, as you all know, the conservation of the physical documents. Um, there are some degradation, clear degradation of uh, films and glass plates. The second challenge is inventory. Um, so we are proceeding by, by sub-collection uh, from the boxes to the photos, and not all the flights, uh, the flight maps are available, and this is of course one uh, of the problem. We are lacking some um, metadata that could be uh, that could be used for uh, the inventory. 
Also, the terminology varies between the sub-collections, so it means that for a same uh, picture, uh, it could be named differently from a collection to another. Um, and this is, of course, a problem to identify the duplicates. This is just a, a quick example. Here we have uh, six different objects with uh, the same name in the database, but uh, they are corresponding to different objects um, on film and paper. Uh, at the end, we understood that um, three of them have been acquired in, in different campaign, um, and at the end, uh, we conclude that these are three duplicates uh, leading to six different um, uh, file names, file, file, uh, file objects. So, another uh, other challenge um, that we want to, to deal with to, is to identify the gaps. So, we have uh, an inventory based on the, what the, the information uh, lying on the boxes. Uh, we want to identify the gaps in the collection, missing uh, photographs in, in the box, um, uh, photographs that could have been uh, lost uh, at some point. And to, to do all this, uh, we of course have a problem of uh, human resources. Another, uh, another challenge, um, we, we work together with the, um, the, the Congolese partner, uh, so it's the, the Geographic Institute of, uh, of Congo in Kinshasa. They are facing similar problems, but with a huge uh, scale factor um, of difference. Um, the next challenge is the scanning of all these, um, all these documents. The scanning, of course, for preservation, but also for uh, scientific exploitation, uh, for instance, for photo photogrammetric processing. And in an, all this, we need to find compromise, compromise in terms of uh, human resources affected, allocated to this uh, activity, um, compromise also uh, with the demand of, the, of, of, this, uh, of this information of the budget available and, of course, um, the time frame and the, and the equipment. Accessibility is the second uh, uh, main objective that we are uh, following, uh, making that collection <coughs> uh, available through first uh, create an inventory uh, devoid of ambiguity, remove all or identify all these duplicates, and uh, finally, uh, create a catalog, um, an efficient catalog, which links the, the original document with the flight maps and uh, with uh, the, the database, um, the, the footprint on the, the, the vector footprint uh, on the map, and finally, the scanned uh, documents. Um, Finally, uh, we are also addressing another challenge, uh, or we wish to address another challenge, uh, is the, the legal issues. Uh, in terms of issues, I, should, I would prefer to, to use the term of concern, um, because it's not an issue yet. Um, the property of the collection, uh, this is a question actually. We, we are not sure that we are owning the collection uh, as, a, as an institution, and even though the, the trend in Belgium uh, is evolving and this ownership could be, uh, uh, could be modified. Um, the rights for the, release, uh, the, for the release of the scans, we, we, need, we need to assess what, can we, what we can do with the, with the scans, because indeed we are not uh, dealing with uh, data from, from covering concerning Belgium, but uh, concerning uh, another country, a sovereign country. So we need to deal with uh, diplomatic sensi sensitivity and also ideological uh, sensitivities. And this is why we are um, strongly collaborating with the Geographic Institute in, uh, of Congo. They have a collection there um, in a very uh, poor uh, state. Um, they have maps, uh, flight maps, uh, real photos. So we, we try to collaborate on inventory all these uh, documents in order to at some point create 
potentially create a unique collection of uh, available maps and aerial photographs. Not all photographs are located in Kinshasa. They are disseminated all over the country in uh, former um, units of the IGC. But still, we, we start with, with Kinshasa, and it's already a, a big challenge. Um, and besides of that, we also uh, provide some GIS training courses, but this is something else. But the idea also behind this is to establish a link, um, an institutional link between our uh, two institutes in order to, um, to be able as, um, to, to, to decide to put the, the, the data available uh, for the users uh, at a later stage. So, so far the, the, the process is very slow and the skill is very slow, uh, is very low because this uh, institute, institution has been abandoned for uh, decades uh, in, in Congo and it is certainly not a priority uh, nowadays. But um, yeah, we do what we can. <coughs> so, um, as Benoit mentioned this morning, um, the reason why we, we start working on this, uh, uh, on this collection uh, valorization, of course it's because it's, it is part of a mission statement, but also because uh, we use this data uh, as, a, um, as an input for the research project that we are uh, dealing with. We essentially focus uh, on Central Africa for natural hazards uh, assessment and, natural and uh, related risk. So he, he already um, showed this morning the orthophoto mosaic uh, over this uh, Kivu Basin region. It's a region where, as shown on this picture, you have different type of landscapes uh, showing on top left uh, the pristine forest um, on the, on, in, in the sea and some affected uh, landscape uh, affected by landslides and bottom right a uh, strongly um, anthropized uh, landscape in Burundi. So, in this project, um, I'm sorry, the, this is the work of uh, Arthur de Picker, I forgot to mention, but um, what he did is to create um, an orthophoto mosaic of this uh, region um, dated back uh, 58 and compare this um, land, uh, land cover with more recent land cover. Um, created from Landsat and, uh, and um, Sentinel, and he was able to show the dynamic of the of the land cover for for this period, 58 up to 2016. So one of the outputs, um, this is actually a, a side a side information. The the major concern was about landslide, but here I show the relation between the um, the land cover uh, in DFC, uh, the, the impact of the, the Rwanda genocide uh, on the deforestation in DFC when the, the flux of refugee um, uh, were coming in, was coming into, uh, into DFC to, to settle there and cut wood for, uh, for the needs. Another example in, uh, in Burundi. Um, the, the researcher was comparing uh, different um, coverage, uh, aerial photographs from the 50, 70 and 80 in order to uh, recreate the, the landslide and uh, erosion history of uh, the city of Bujumbura. And um, another example, in the city of Bukavu uh, in Congo, in the FC, um, the, the, red, the, the, the yellow shape is showing a major uh, slow-moving landslide that is affecting uh, it's approxi approximately four, four square kilometers. Today, it's, uh, nowadays, it's a, it's a slum, and uh, yeah, the density is something like uh, 70,000 people living per square kilometer. So it's it's very dense, uh, very dense, and. Um, yeah, a researcher was interested to study it uh, two times and try to, um, to see if there was some um, impact of urbanization on the velocity of the, of, of the landslide. And the answer was yes. 
at the origin the, the landslide was natural, but the speed, the velocity has increased uh, as the, 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 the region was uh, urbanized. Another application for the city uh, of Goma. As you know, uh, Goma is uh, under the threat of um, an active volcano that was erupting, uh, erupting last year. So it's important, it's very near, uh, it's 10 or 15 kilometers south of the, of the volcano. We have uh, uh, a big city uh, of more than 1 million inhabitants and um, study this, uh, the, the, the city uh, evolution uh, with time was uh, very important uh, and also use an input for uh, risk assessment for the, for the population. And so um, we also used the uh, uh, aerial photographs, uh, archive aerial photographs to better understand how uh, this city uh, has the, the dynamic of, of the city. So, to conclude, um, we have a significantly large collection of uh, aerial photographs from the, uh, from the colonial period. Um, the inventory is ongoing, but uh, not yet finalized. But we, what we can say is that we estimate that we have more than 200,000 unique uh, documents on various media, uh, films or paper or glass plates. Um, we hope to, um, to, f to finalize the systematic scanning of that uh, collection within the next uh, five years. We already have uh, uh, scanned 10% of, um, of this collection and make uh, this data accessible to, um, in, in the, in the, in the, geo the geocatalog of the uh, Africa Museum. Um, also, uh, what we have shown, the, the slide is not complete here, apparently. There is a problem of resolution, but um, what we have shown is it is very important, um, even crucial, to establish a link with, uh, with a Congolese institution in order to, to have uh, access to potentially missing information in Belgium and create a, 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 common, a common archive. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so I'm Lydia, and, uh, but as you see here, this work is uh, uh, part of uh, yeah, the work of many, many other people. Annette and uh, Thomas is already here. So we try more, actually more than a month ago, already a year, a year ago, um, to try to review uh, the different processing and application of historical images in geoscience. And this is what I would like to show you. Yes. So, um, as historical images, we mean uh, scanned uh, analog uh, images obtained from film camera on board of airplane, but also satellites. And as you know, um, historical images are a valuable means to reconstruct detail um, topographic information and change detection analysis over the past 10 years. We saw already this morning a lot of challenges uh, in, the photogrammetric in, the, in the data and in the photogrammetric uh, workflow, also relating to uh, deformation, uh, limitation of uh, degradation of the images due to uh, physical storage, also missing uh, camera information, and also important is the lack of a clear uh, processing workflow and as well data availability. With this image, I want to show you something, that a new uh, 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 problem of the data that probably didn't appear in, the, in this morning already. Like, as you see, uh, it's not only about uh, deformation and degradation, but sometimes you have really physical uh, issue on the image. You see here, this was a cut, then they tried to stitch with some uh, tape this, this cut, and of course you can imagine this created quite some problem that's beyond the, the scan resolution or whatever other problem. So, what we try to do is to review a published uh, paper uh, that deal with the photogrammetric processing of historical images. And also we would like to uh, then provide a recommendation. How do we, uh, what is the best uh, practice to uh, processing uh, historical images? <coughs> So this is, uh, I just wanted to mention that historical images are a lot of, a lot of immense amount of data 
scanner is a, up, that, um, is a subset of historical images, but specifically what we did is we studied that reprocessing or processing uh, historical images to generate orthophoto or digital elevation model. And so what we found uh, is about 149, maybe we're going to round up to 150, uh, published between 2002 and early 2022. And uh, we start to building a database. This was a very, uh, very hard work, a lot of work, uh, defining publications and the geography, so it means like uh, where are locating the study site, which type of data do we have, because uh, as I mentioned, we deal with uh, aerial images, but also satellite, uh, spy satellite images, type of data set, archive is available, number of images, GSD, and many more information that you can see here, as well in terms of <coughs> processing, so which method did uh, um, author use, which type of software, uh, GCP, uh, and also pre-processing and uh, general uh, workflow. And also we try, <laughs> really we try, to find out some accuracy of this, uh, uh, the published data in terms of number of GCP, in terms of really accuracy in comparison with some reference data, and, uh, and so also some post-processing. And also what is the main output of this photogrammetric uh, processing in terms of orthophoto, digital elevation model, and what is the resolution. So uh, with this the data set that I show you, we try to answer some questions in relation to the, uh, the archive, as well to the data, product and applications, processing and uh, accuracy. And today I try to give you some of the, uh, the some answer to this question that's highlighted here. So what type of archive exists and where are located? Uh, are these images in the archive uh, freely available? What is the temporal spatial coverage of the data set? as well with type of product and application do we have in terms of research, research field, uh, orthophoto, digital elevation model, and as well, uh, so processing, uh, software type of uh, pre-processing that are uh, applied in a, a published study, and as well uh, the accuracy, so which type of metrics are used for uncertainty assessment. Okay, so let's start with the uh, archive, and this is the spatial uh, distribution of the uh, study site color by archive location. So what you see, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, sorry, this is, uh, <laughs> the workshop is about the aerial images, but it's hard to now distinguish. So we have both aerial and some case aerial and satellite, spy satellite uh, film camera. So what you see actually, the global <coughs> coverage is given by the satellite data. And uh, we, we have a global, uh, go global coverage, and, but what you see specifically, aerial images on this uh, European country. And when we look about uh, the archive location, so um, spy, uh, spy satellites are mainly uh, from U.S., so archives are located in U.S., while for aerial images, most of the study, so the, the, the location of the archive is linked to the um, area, uh, so the, to the country of uh, the different studies. So as you see, for instance, in Italy, a lot of the studies and the archive and the images come from Italy, few places in Africa, but this is... Uh, um, is the global uh, picture that we got from the published study. Uh, when we look about the uh, um, archive uh, country and also aerial images availability. So what you see uh, on the uh, y-axis, this is all the archive that we uh, get from the uh, published uh, uh, paper. So we have more than uh, 20 uh, archives. And the first things that you see, first of all, the, the biggest part is that not all the published paper give information where are these images, from where they come from, and where did they collect these images. We do not know. We might not know that it's not for free, but we don't know from where, uh, which archive. Um, and this is, you see these the three colors. So clearly, uh, freely available images is very is limited. So we have uh, France and uh, Iceland. So this is the, most of the images are freely available. Italy, not at all, and, uh, but also Austria and uh, Australia, so these are not, uh, uh, so the images are not freely available. And so uh, among these, uh, uh, um, I say like 149 studies, aerial images 113, and with these 113 studies, we have 363 data sets. This means, uh, so images collect a different uh, time. 
from the same uh, study. And we have more than 62 uh, archives for different uh, countries. And I would like to mention here that actually UK is the country which uh, hosts the most number of archives, and the first two are the ones that where the images are available. I don't know if this is true. We have to rely on what the author uh, uh, published. So perhaps we should check before to publish our uh, review paper, but this is what is coming out uh, from, the, from our review. So let's have a look about the uh, data and the timeline of historical images. So what you see here in this image, in this uh, plot, you have uh, the acquisition year versus the uh, studies uh, sorted by uh, earliest year. And you have, so the line indicates the study and the, the, the dots actually indicate the multiple data set. So the first things that you see, and this is actually what is the, the, the beauty of historical images, most of the study is about uh, time series, so change detection analysis. And that's why a lot of the study deal with diff multiple uh, epochs. And uh, the largest data set actually goes from, the earliest is from 1934, and the last uh, data set is uh, after um, 2010. What you see, uh, so most of the cases we have so multiple data sets, and uh, if you just want to compare with the uh, satellite, the spy satellite, it's very narrow uh, in terms of time from the 60s to the uh, 80s, uh, early 90s. And, uh, and this is actually the advantage of uh, uh, historical area images that you really can cover almost 100 years. <coughs> so when we uh, group this uh, <coughs> by, uh, so by the data set, so this is kind of uh, so an overview of how many data set do we have per year. And what you can see, so there is a large uh, data set on the 1970s, 1980s. Uh, again, spy satellite is very uh, uh, narrow. And uh, we have a kind of uh, uh, very few uh, studies that deal with the uh, data since the 1940s or post-war, but this we don't know exactly what is, could be the reason. So let's have a look how many images are used in this uh, published study. And uh, if we plot here the maximum number of images per study, we see that uh, most of the uh, work is uh, work, uh, deal with quite a few number of images. Uh, which is great, it also actually means that probably the scale of the uh, application is rather local to catchment scale. But we have few studies that will deal with a very large number of data sets, and this is in the case of reconstruction uh, using um, of, uh, um, uh, um, ah, Svalbard and uh, Iceland as well, Greenland, so with a large data set so over a large scale. And again, <laughs> There are uh, lack of information, even seems not relevant, but it might be relevant to know how many images did you use in your study, and this is not always uh, reported. So uh, now let's move about some information uh, relating to the processing of these uh, images. We uh, so summarize what are the uh, uh, studies uh, according to the different processing workflow. And uh, as you can see, uh, structure for motion multiple stereo is the one that used most. Uh, but as well uh, standard photogrammetric uh, processing, and then is followed by time shift, only structure for motion, manual uh, processing, and also not available. And um, if we uh, consider this uh, with respect to the use of fiducial marks, uh, again, some they do not report uh, what is actually one third they didn't report what is the uh, if they use fiducial marks or not. Some 40% uh, they say that they use fiducial marks during the processing, and 24% no. And uh, now, if you look about the type of software that are used, uh, again, so linked to the structure for motion, multiview stereo. So, Agisoft is the main uh, used software, followed by uh, Erdas, then Pix4D, MicMac, SoxSect, and all the rest that you see here. It was quite interesting because some software I didn't even know exists, so it was quite interesting to see that. <coughs> so um, we already, uh, in the previous presentations, see that there are also some pre-processing step. This is quite uh, relating to the type of software that you use. But um, again, like according to uh, our review, not all the studies specify if they did some pre-processing of the images. 70% uh, didn't any pre-processing, and 32% yes. 
And uh, this is include uh, uh, mainly geometric uh, preprocessing, but also radiometric and both. And if you look about the geometric preprocessing, here is plotting both aerial and satellite. But if you focus on the aerial images, we see that masking, what already been uh, shown before, is quite uh, used, as well uh, cropping and some uh, image transformation that was already introduced. And in some cases, probably this is relating to the type of information that we have, is the pre uh, calibration of the uh, camera. And then when we talk about uh, radiometric preprocessing, also it's enhancement of the image. So this is, can be contra contrast, uh, exposure, uh, yeah, actually also no information, um, and sharpening, so everything that can improve the radiometric information of the images. So let's now uh, have a look about uh, product and uh, uh, applications. So if you look about what are the main applications of this study, uh, glassology win. And this is the, um, most of the uh, historical images are used to quantify change detection on uh, glacier and potentially reconstruct mass change. But then also we have uh, geomorphology and uh, similar uh, methodological study to understand how the methods of processing these images and, uh, and the challenges <coughs> related to that. But then we also have archaeology, forestry, uh, land use, land cover, volcanology, ecology, and so on. And uh, in terms of output, so the product, we have, uh, so again, we were focused on the study that processing images to generate uh, orthophoto and uh, 3D and digital elevation models. So we didn't analyze study that already use available orthophoto. And so the output, uh, what we can see here, this is uh, uh, most of the uh, data set were interesting on 3D information, so elevation information, which can, would be uh, point cloud and, and the digital elevation model, but also there were studies that processing these historical images to generate orthophoto and as well uh, do uh, geoformization of these uh, uh, or, uh, images. So if you look now, what are the main uh, spatial resolution that can be obtained using uh, historical images in terms of digital elevation model? So um, we try to see if we find something in relation to the application, but actually not really. I mean, if you look, for instance, at glaciology, it's also true that it's the largest application, but can go from a very high resolution digital elevation model to very coarse of 20 meter. So we don't really see a correlation in relation to resolution and application. But it's very interesting that, first of all, there is a large uh, number of studies that can reconstruct from these historical images uh, digital elevation model below uh, two meters. And, uh, and then we have also a range between two and, and five and also much uh, coarser uh, resolution. And similar way, actually, with uh, uh, orthophoto. Um, as you know, I mean, orthophoto is a high resolution compared to the digital television model. And again, also, we do not see much uh, difference according to the application. But definitely, the, the, the orthophoto that can be generated from historical images <coughs> according to the published study, it's very, very high resolution. So uh, below uh, one meter, actually 50 centimeters is the uh, uh, highest uh, range. So, uh, now I would like to move to uh, the last part that is about the accuracy of this uh, data. Um, first of all, we try to see, uh, so other out of studies, uh, as, I as I mentioned, uh, they use uh, structure for motion and multi stereo. And as you know, not all the software uh, uh, has the possibility to use a fiducial marks. So we were interested to see, does the use of fiducial mark as an impact on the uh, quality, on the accuracy of the uh, uh, outputs? So problem number one, that uh, as I mentioned already, not all the studies specify if they use fiducial or not. And, uh, but what we see, basically there is not really, uh, there is not really correlation. So we have very high uh, accurate uh, uh, products with, without fiducial and also with fiducial. So this is not a parameter that according to the published study uh, make a difference on the on the residual, on the quality of the, uh, of the historical product. Also, what do we see? Uh, that um, we have two types of uh, 
comparison, it's so called area based and point based. So, point based is when the comparison, uh, the reference data is measured, like uh, for instance from GNSS and the so very high accurate points. And area based is when this reference data coming from raster, from, uh, for instance, uh, elevation model. And also here, I uh, don't know if you can clearly see the, the, the dots and the square, but we don't see a difference. So uh, uh, there is not really a link with the uh, comparison source. But also, I would like to mention that we also thought about maybe there is a relation with the uh, accuracy of the uh, comparison data or the reference data. And this is really was a, a catastrophe because we really didn't see so basically the study, they didn't provide what is the quality of your reference data, what is the accuracy of your reference data. And this is what you see. You see basically on these studies, only these dots reporting some value relation to the, uh, to the accuracy of the, of the reference data. And they can change the reference data from an SRTM to a very accurate uh, GCP. So this is also a difference. But we don't have enough information to, um, to um, quantify this. So, uh, but uh, this is still work in progress, by the way. <laughs> so, to arrive to uh, a summary, um, in relation to the archive, there are many archives, but there is a lack of overview. So, uh, still, what we deal here is with uh, the archive in relation to the study that reprocesses images. But there are many more archives that we were not even. Um, it was very interesting to see archive in Japan, archive in Taiwan, they were not available. And um, there is not a clear overview, where are these archives, where are, which type of images do they, do they have, are freely available or not. And, uh, and also in relation to the uh, availability, most archives are not free. And of course when we deal with the research, I mean, I think about also the Instituto Geografico Militare here, each image, we, we bought this <laughs> data set, if you want to cover entire catchment with a good uh, resolution, each image costs almost 50 euro. And this is not feasible if you want to cover a large area. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is an issue. And uh, so another problem is relating to the data and the processing. So we see that there is a, a worldwide coverage. So it means that also there is an interest on a worldwide about this type of data, aerial and as well uh, spy satellite images. Uh, historical images can provide very high to uh, high spatial resolution, very high also mean submetric uh, resolution for both digital elevation model and orthophoto. And the processing are still not fully automatic. So there are a lot of pre-processing steps that are not require a lot of uh, manual check mm -hmm. and uh, as well also the, uh, for instance, the fiducial uh, detection. And so there is still a lot of work to uh, get into an automatic uh, workflow. But definitely what we could see that the use of structure for, the use of structure for motion really helped to uh, unlock uh, this image uh, archive. And regarding the accuracy, well, uh, I think we need to find a kind of uh, an agreement what are the best practices to describe our data, quantify our uncertainty and the, also our reference data. So that definitely there is, not, there is a lack of best uh, practice in, in this regard. But we all agree that historical images have a great, but not yet uh, used uh, potential for uh, change detection uh, studies. And uh, with this, I would like to conclude, just mention that uh, it would be really great if you continue this discussion during the EGU, European Geoscience Union. This is a conference that will be in Vienna uh, in April 23, 28. And uh, we have a session about this. So Annette is also the convener. As, uh, the title is From Historical Images to Modern High Resolution Topography, Method and Application in Geosciences. And it would be very nice to please submit the abstract if you would like to join, and it would be nice to discuss it again there. <coughs>
and uh, this island has uh, has several hazard, natural hazards and disasters. Um, about m a bit more than 40% of the territory is classified in high to very high risk zone. So, um, for example, here are some examples of uh, phenomena we, are, we have to deal with. Her ear is um, 600, uh, <coughs> 600 meter long uh, gullies that formed uh, during the, the cyclone in 2008 and here uh, I don't know if you can see very, it very well but you have houses here so uh, the people who were not very so who were not so far to be um, to to be important uh, I forget my, my English for this word but uh, <laughs> to yeah, to die with the, this landslide, let's say. Uh, here is another example of a landslide that covered an entire village in, in uh, 1989 uh, during the cyclone Feringa. Here it's a pretty huge um, rock slide of uh, 30,000 uh, meters cubed that covered the entire uh, uh, main uh, road uh, that, uh, that goes from the, the north to the south of the island. Uh, you can see the two ways here of the, the road. <coughs> here it's another example of what happened during another cyclone which uh, happened in 2007, uh, the cyclone Gamed. Uh, you have a shoreline that at some point uh, retreat for more than uh, 20, about 20 meters back and here is a main bridge that <coughs> collapsed because of river floods during the same cyclone. Here, uh, again on the slide, so it's a pretty large mudslide uh, that created a dam in the main river here, you can see. And uh, the last image I show you, it's a flooded river uh, during another cyclone. So the question is uh, <coughs> why there are so many hazards in this small island. Uh, first of all, uh, La Réunion, so it's, a, as I said, it's quite a small island, so it's about 40 kilometers uh, long. Uh, on uh, 50 kilometers wide, uh, large. Uh, the summit is at about 3,000 uh, uh, 3, meters high, and so in 20 kilometers, uh, you reach from zero to 3,000, so the, the topographic gradient is quite high. So you have steep slope, vertical cliffs, very inside the valley, as you can see on uh, these uh, pictures of uh, the island. Um, <coughs> concerning the geology, uh, most, um, the main part of the island is mostly uh, made of weak volcanic deposits um, that is uh, mm -hmm. ready to go as cubic kilometers landslide. And also the last thing we have um, to drag a landslide, the main trigger is that it's raining a lot. Uh, here uh, you have the, the map of the annual uh, rainfall in, in La Réunion. Just to give you an idea, it's at some, in some places, so especially here where it's uh, the active volcano. Um, the annual rainfall is 50 time, 15 times uh, more than the annual rainfall of home. Um, so why uh, so many, uh, why the, <coughs> the rainfall is so high? It's uh, because tropical cyclone, it's regularly uh, the, the island. Here you have different tracks, tracks of uh, cyclones from uh, 1948 to 2014. And uh, so La Réunion also holds some uh, world uh, records of uh, rainfall. Uh, for example, during uh, the cyclone La Yassant, um, at some places uh, you reach more than uh, 5,000 <coughs> 5, millimeters in 10 days and up to 6,000 uh, millimeter, 6, 6, millimeters in uh, 15 days. So it's quite, quite a lot. Um, so, as um, as Bergen, we have to. Uh, one of our job is to characterize uh, natural hazards. And so, to answer to uh, to characterize these hazards, we have to answer to what they are, where and when they occur, and how many they are. And so, to do so, um, hopefully, we have uh, <coughs> this uh, famous data set. Uh, which are uh, the um, archive aerial photographs. And uh, they are for France and for La Réunion, they are uh, in open access from uh, the website Romantelton of the IGN, so the, the National Geographic Service of uh, France. 
And uh, here you have, uh, so for La Réunion, we have uh, 13, we record 13 major events that affected the entire island. And we have um, <coughs> a survey of a uh, resolution of uh, five, uh, 25, uh, 25,000 that break the signatures. So let's try and use them to build 3D view of the landscape using uh, SFM and a multi view here. <clears throat> so here is a sketch that shows you the pipeline to um, first start from the photos and then preprocess them and then uh, use uh, the SFM multi view processing to build uh, 3D modeling and auto photographies and after to to for, to to quantify the the, the impact of. Uh, of, of the cyclones, which is our goal actually. So I will stop on some of this point because uh, in La Réunion, uh, these pictures have some advantages and, 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 uh, and challenges we have to, to deal with. And the first uh, one is the stereoscopic condition. So um, because uh, La Réunion is a tropical island, we have uh, adverse meteorolo meteorological phenomena, so it uh, it implies that we have uh, multi-date surveys. So, because we have multi-date survey, we have shooting redun red redundancy. Uh, so, multiple sampling of the landscape topography. Here, you have an example of uh, one color represents one date, for example. Um, it's also quite um, an advantage because uh, when you fly from one day to another, you can change your height of flight. Here is an example. So um, we have a uh, flight that uh, the difference between the flight A is about uh, 1,000 meters, which is quite high. And um, but the last, another thing which is not so good for us is that because we are flying in the multiple day, uh, we can have change in meteorological conditions. So clouds or lights that uh, <coughs> so change in light, which uh, uh, implies a uh, some shadows and photos, as you can see here, for example, uh, may appear. <coughs> so concerning then after the pre-processed photographs, so one of the questions we have is, uh, can we use uh, raw uh, pictures without, uh, pre without pre-processing? Actually, in the real world, as it has been already said today, um, during the scanning, the pictures are not really uh, straight, and so the center of the, all the images is not uh, the same. So we have to do one first thing is to rotate, to correct uh, these pictures, uh, to first uh, locate the fiducial, then correct them from the rotation, and then crop them at the same scale. So here, uh, it's uh, for example, here it's an example of the, the spread of the original uh, center of the images, and we are, uh, we observe that something with. Uh, Three there's a difference between the center of a uh, uh, set of images. <coughs> then concerning the GCPs and, and CPs positioning, um, also we have some challenges that we have to deal with in La Réunion. So, as I said, uh, La Réunion has a large elevation variation, so we need to put some uh, <clears throat> uh, GCP is at the top, but also on the valley. But the problem is um, we have a, a rope topography, so at some point it's difficult to go to put some point there. We have a dense vegetation uh, at the top also, but at the bottom we have uh, highly dynamic rivers and deep valleys. With, so, some, for example, there is uh, deep shadows too. Um, and the last thing, so we have also steep slopes. And the last thing we have is that we have, uh, at the, between the, the bottom and the top, we have uh, sliding surfaces with a landslide, with slow moving landslide that moves up to uh, one meter per year. So it's quite an important displacement. So it may be difficult to put some, to position some, some GCP. <coughs> So, um, if we look at uh, different sources of reference coordinates, uh, so we have, we can do some field topographic measurements, but product and accuracy, the product accuracy is about uh, less than one meter. Um, we can use also surface. Um, 
surface sources of reference like a uh, uh, leader D DSM or DTM and then we reach product uh, accuracy of one to five meters um, in precision. And then also we try to use a web mapping portal which is quite useful when you do not have a high resolution topographic model or even you can't go to the field. And this gives a product accuracy of five to 10 meters. Um, in La Réunion, what we have is because of this challenging uh, local condition, we have to adapt and combine the different sources of, uh, according to the area of interest. Um, so another thing we have to deal with is to, to draw masks on the pictures. So I think maybe some of you have to do that also, but as I showed before, we have in some places a lot of clothes that appear in the, in the pictures, so we have to map them. And also it's an island, so you have the sea. Uh, around it. So you have to mask for the sea because it's moving too. Uh, I won't go in detail in the processing, so to build the DSM uh, and auto photos, uh, we did it with uh, the commercial uh, software Agile Soft MetaShip. And I will switch directly to uh, quantify the impact of cyclone, and especially the one on the landslide and the erosion processes. So here uh, it's a theorem of difference. So it's a digital. Um, so it's the, 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 the topographic model of 2015. So uh, which was uh, obtained thanks to a leader uh, survey, and we compare it to um, a digital surface model obtained from uh, SFM uh, MSV applied to the IR photograph of uh, 1978. So this map shows you 37 years of mass wasting. And on this one, uh, we can look at some different versus some phenomena that happened during these uh, 30 years, 37 years, sorry. So the first one is the goodie I talked to you uh, just a little bit before in the presentation. So here is a picture of it, um, a larger one. So, um, so here it's a picture of uh, the, the this goodie that form uh, just after that that was taken just after its formation, so one month just after. Um, <clears throat> and the idea is, uh, how can we study uh, this, uh, this phenomena? And especially to study this, um, we have to retrieve uh, its morphological characteristics. And uh, to do so, so we used the DSM, but from archive from 2000. Um, 78, so for before uh, the the landslide, uh, the goodie formed, and the one from two, uh, 90, uh, 90, 40, uh, 84, sorry, just after, so four years after it it uh, it it, uh, it formed. So it gives us a pre-topography and, and a post-topography, and then um, comparing the both, uh, we are able to retrieve so the volume the surface, but also to have the shape of the topography. Another uh, main one we, show, we can see on this map is the one that has been triggered during a cyclone in 2014. So it's, this landslide is about one million meters cube. And another one, which is quite impressive too, it's another one that has been um, formed during the cyclone, yes, I'm sorry. In 1980, uh, this one has a volume of uh, 0.6 million meters cube, uh, and because um, this uh, this landslide caused the, the die of an entire family, so um, so the, the, the hazards here. So on that map, we can see the hazards that uh, the, 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 that uh, that is in uh, in that area. So in this little plateau, which is actually inhabited. And the last thing, thanks to uh, the comparison between uh, the, the, the topographic model we retrieved from archives, is to make some uh, inventories. So here is an example of the landslide catalog we built from uh, the, all the landslides that have been triggered in, um, in the south of Salazi, so it's an, a small area in the island. So we we draw all the contour and calculate the volume of this uh, this non-site. We have the area, the volume, and so we can do some statistics about it. 
and especially um, <coughs> look at the area, uh, the, the distribution of the area and related to which are uh, quite um, precious data for a probabilistic hazard analysis. <coughs> So to conclude, uh, archive aerial photographs are um, gives us, uh, 70 years of insightful data to quantify uh, the impact of a cyclone in uh, La Réunion. So it's about one survey every five to eight years uh, for the entire island since 1949. Um, the local geography of the islands brings some advantages and challenges from uh, SFM multi-view processing on, uh, on these photographs. <coughs> and uh, the uh, DSM allows us to quantify a morphological change between two dates, with vertical precision reaching up to one meters. One meters. And uh, thanks to this archive, we uh, document the impact of the cyclone and erosion processes in terms of location, 3D morphology, landslide inventory, and so we can do also quantitative uh, hazard analysis. So thanks to this data, we were also able to publish some of this also, the results that I show you in three, uh, in three papers. And the last thing I want to say is the because uh, so the follow-up and this perspective of this uh, example that I show you today is because um, what we can constant is because of aerial photographs find about 70 years of landscape evolution, they can start capturing uh, 100 years event statistics. So for um, for geomorphologists who work on natural results, we tend to streamline this processing of aerial photographs in future analysis, actually. Um, um, the recipe to do that is to have a stabilized uh, workflow to prepare the data set to SFM multi-view processing. So if you have best practice to, um, to advise us. Um, it's uh, an MSV pipeline to optimize multi-view epoch production. So, so again, if you have some tips to tell us. And uh, the last thing uh, that also uh, have been said today is we need uh, to have a rigorous method to characterize the product accuracy actually. Then after we will uh, be able to um, tell what are the, uh, so yeah, the product accuracy. Yeah. Yes, hello, so my name is Marvin. I'm working on the Doria project together with uh, Willi, who will tell you tomorrow how the georeferencing is working for our project. And yeah, I will do a presentation on semi-automatic object detection in historical aerial images with a human in the loop. So, as you probably all know, the last air raids of World War II were around 70 years ago, and there are still quite a lot of unexploded ordnance um, that pose a significant explosion hazard in Central Europe, but also other areas. Um, and this means that uh, many construction projects in Central Europe require some sort of risk assessment, whether or not there are um, UXOs or whether it's safe to just dig. And these, ex uh, these assessments are very expensive because they require an expert and the data um, that we saw earlier. And in combination, this means um, that reducing the time needed per labeling per image is uh, actually quite valuable. And so our goal is to find increased combat activity in aerial images and we want to do some semi-automatic uh, approach to generate these explosive ordnance maps. And why do we focus on craters? Because craters are basically um, one of the most abundant <coughs> warfare type objects and because they are direct, um, pres uh, direct evidence for the presence of unexploded bombs because well, they are bombs um, that make craters. Um, yeah, our data set is um, from the National Archives and Records Administration in Washington and the Historic Environment Scotland in Edinburgh. And we only use um, images from 1943 to 1945. And those images are usually some sort of reconnaissance flight after a bombing run. So the bomb craters in the image are usually quite new and fresh. And the acquisition and the processing has been done by the Luftbilddatenbank, Dr. Kalski in Beha. They did some pre-processing to the image, they georeferenced the image, and they did um, the manual labeling of all 
warfare related objects that um, does also include trenches and actual uh, UXOs that are visible in the image um, but we currently only focus on the craters yes, so our data set has um, a minimum crater size of around 1 meter an average of 8 meters and a maximum of 17 meters um, all of the images we use are normalized to a ground sampling distance of 0 0.25 meters and the um, image size is around 2,000 by 2,000 pixels up until a maximum of 17,000 by 17,000 pixels. In total we have 99 images of urban and rural areas in Germany and Austria. Um, yes, our previous work was um, a fully autom um, the evaluation whether a fully automatic object detection does work and for this we split our data sets into um, smaller patches so we can process them in our network and also split this, these smaller patches into a training, validation and a test set um, and then we trained 12 different object detectors on the uh, data set and to the right you can see the precision recall curve so the recall is have all craters been found and the precision means how many false positives do we have in our detections and you can sort of clearly see that most object detectors, uh, object detectors have a very similar profile and all perform very similar except for um, yeah, three, four um, object detectors that performed worse because A, they were not made for satellite imagery or B, they were uh, relying on some pre-training with color images and our data set is um, without color which um, reduces their performance significantly but we noticed because all of the de uh, detectors have a very similar performance um, that A, we need still more data to um, so more data still improves um, our approach but also um, that certain images or certain areas are just basically impossible to detect um, and those areas are usually urban areas where there's like dense settlements for example in the middle of Vienna where every crater just looks completely different and doesn't have any resemblance with the usual crater in a field um, Yes, so this is an example. So in a just barren field, our detector works basically perfectly. Um, you just define the region and an image uh, in an image, and the detector will detect um, most craters um, perfectly, which means that for urban environments, we can sort of speed up the process by up to 50%. However, uh, if there's like a quite significant domain change, so in this case, in the top right, um, so in the black area you can see craters that are present in the training data set so the network is actually able to detect those almost flawlessly but to the left you can see craters that are very fresh in snow which means they are very black and those we do not have this is actually the only image we have of really fresh craters in snow um, which also results in our uh, network not being able to detect well any of them and then in the bottom you can see two examples of false positives um, the right one are very small impacts um, which we think are from artilleries but not actually from bomb craters um, so it's really hard to differentiate between, differentiate between these two and to the bottom left you can actually see some artillery positions um, which have been um, also detected as a positive because um, we also lack a large amount of artillery positions so the network can learn that this is actually not a crater and our idea here is that we do sort of a two-stage pipeline you want to have the object detector, uh, object detector, detector that outputs the bounding boxes for the craters and then a user would come in and either refine the detections if they are almost perfect so they are perfect or when he decides that the detections are way too bad he can use the interactive adaptation where he just um, manipulates the image into super pixels so we reduce the amount of pixels from up to 17,000 by 17,000 to around 1,000 or maybe 10,000 it's really dependent on what the user thinks um, he wants to have in the image and then the user also inputs um, some new data for us but only a very small amount and then we compare the user input with what the network output of the, uh, the feature output of the object detector is and by that we want to refine the final um, detection 
And yeah, this is some sort of work in progress, and this is essentially what we are currently thinking about. We want an anchor that is um, a crater that has been detected correctly. We want a positive that is a new crater that the network is not able to detect. And you want a negative which has been classified as a crater but is actually not a crater. And we then compute um, some sort of embeddings and in the end we want to compare these and adapt our initial network based on it. Um, so yeah, this is the really uh, the idea. So we have the anchor that is x, um, the negative which is x minus, which is currently closer to x in the feature space, and x plus which is currently further away. And by training and learning from the user input, we want to move x and x plus closer together while x minus gets further away, so we do not misclassify it as a crater again. And now, if we look at the features um, of the network itself before the adaption, we can see on the left um, the input image, where the red circles are the detections of the network, and the black circles are the markings from our industry partner. And in the middle, you can see the image segmented into superpixels, and on the right, you can see the maximum features of these superpixels. And Obviously, the features on the right correspond with the features on uh, the detections on the left. So everywhere where the similarity between the between a selected crater and the superpixel is high, the network actually outputs there's a, likely a crater there. And everywhere where it's low, it doesn't produce a crater. And our idea was to retrain on, based on these superpixels. And if you just retrain without actual any user input, you can see that the background is um, distant. It's like very, very dissimilar to any of the craters selected. However, you can see that the um, detection itself is not improved, which is normal and to be expected. But when a user would input some sort of um, triplet to the network, in our case, the triplet that I showed you before, um, you can see that we actually in the middle start to get some um, correct detections. And on the bottom, we can see that the detections that uh, have been false positives before are reduced. <coughs> However, you can also see that it's still sort of not correct. And our problem currently is that um, if we over adapt based on this one triplet, um, all of the detections that we just learned are lost, and we sort of need a better way to understand how to retrain the initial network based on this triplet. And this means that our future work will be some sort of meta-learning where we learn the learner that is learning the data set. And this means that instead of having multiple samples that leave, give us a good um, uh, model, we, want, um, we will have one sample that already gives us the perfect prediction, as you can hopefully see from the image. And this is, however, very work in progress, and while there is some literature and it seems to work quite well, we are not very sure if it will work for this data set. Um, yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>